Warning. This episode discusses sensitive topics such as suicide, political violence, and murder. Viewer discretion is advised. If you are not comfortable with such topics, please leave the video now. Hello everybody, and welcome to What Would Your Ideal World Be? A podcast which examines very fascinating people, the topics that they care about, and most importantly, what their ideal world would be. If you like what you see here, please like, share, and subscribe. Ben Harris Quinney is the current chairman of the Bow Group, the oldest conservative think tank in the UK, having been set up in 1951, and he has been in that role since 2011. He has also written for other outlets, like the Daily Express and Breitbart London. Harris Quinney was a previous guest on this show in 2021. His episode will be linked in the description below. Hello, thank you for coming back on once again. My pleasure. Right, the first question I wanted to ask you is that the last time you were here, you were discussing the various failings of the Conservative Party and its government under its then Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Since then, we've had Rishi Sunak enter the fray, among many other things, of course. Do you think he could turn things around for the party to prevent a total disaster for ha from happening to them in 2024? Well, I, I, I skipped back to uh, the last time we spoke earlier, and at, at that time, um, I think it was over a year ago, uh, the Conservative Party were riding high in the polls, um, and you know Boris Johnson was was extremely popular, and so was Rishi Sunak. And what I said was that I thought the fallout from all of the financial decisions they were making and a lot of the non-conservative policy options they were taking um, would lead to a very serious reckoning and their poll rating plummeting and um, you know the last year and a half um, I don't think could have more fulsomely um, gone along that that vein. Um, what Rishi Sunak now has to do um, is what really needed to be done 12 years ago when the Conservative Party came into office which is balance the books, get the national finances under control and start implementing conservatism. Uh, since the Conservatives came in in 2010, they've tripled the national debt. And, you know, the sort of tagline for them coming in was, was that they were going to balance the books. Um, and so it, we were in this extraordinary situation where uh, 12 years later, apart from Brexit, which was something that was a people's movement thrusted upon them, we've, we've had continuation Blair. And of course, Rishi Sunak is, is very much in that Blairite mould, and uh, there is now probably less than two years to right the ship. So I think it would be an extraordinary task, um, even if it was Margaret Thatcher sitting in, in his seat. But from the circumstances that he is in and the, and the nature of who he is and his politics, I, I don't really see them um, being able to to get out of this and to convince you know small c conservatives and red wall voters and people that voted for brexit and then lent their support to the conservatives in 2019 being convinced um i think the, the poll rating will improve from the low ebb of trust but i think they're sort of currently between 25 and 30 be points behind labor which is almost unheard of mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think it, it? What do you think it says about British democracy at the moment? Uh, on, on the fact that when Truss was weeded out, and the fact that Sunak was put in, he was seen as as your favourite journalist of all time, Andrew Neil said, someone who could calm the markets. I think, or something that will favour the markets, or something like that. So, how do you feel about the state we're in, where it seems the markets and a lot of the managerial state that accompanies it? Have a lot more of a say on who gets to run the country than the British public does, let alone Conservative Party members. Well, I think it's when, when people talk about the markets being happy, what they're really saying is the establishment is happy, and people like Andrew Neil are happy when um, there's the, there's the sort of person that they've been used to in power for the last thirty years. And the problem is that there are some really fundamental problems in this country that people keep voting to solve, like mass immigration, like illegal immigration, like the debt crisis that we never really got out of after 2008, um, like the fact that our public services are collapsing around us and our infrastructure is collapsing around us. And, and yet, despite that consistent vote and that consistent opinion from the British public, we keep getting you know, the same old Blairite figures. And even if you ignore all the election results, the Brexit referendum result was the biggest signal that could possibly be sent that the British public want to see things done very differently. You know, that was the political revolution 
uh, in the form of a, a referendum. And so um, the establishment, not just in the United Kingdom, but across the West in the United States, they think that it's a great thing that people like Joe Biden are back in power. But very quickly, you see that figures like Joe Biden and Liz Truss and Theresa May and Emmanuel Macron and, and Schultz in Germany, um, they're, they're, they're running uh, on an analog system in a digital age. Um, a new system is clearly required to take us forward because the Ponzi scheme that is the Western economy is co collapsing. And alongside that, um, the Judeo-Christian uh, structure of society is collapsing and so really what is going to be required to fix that are radical new thinkers um, the other point is that when people talk about the markets being happy uh, the irony is of course that that generally means that the mar markets are happy in the short term but long term we're headed for a major debt crisis and a repeat of 2008 so I think um, Part of it is, is that the establishment obviously want establishment figures in power and want establishment mandates uh, for those figures that, you know, well, we've tried the Trump way, we've tried the Boris way, that was crazy and far right, even though it was to the left of Blair and to the left of Clinton. Um, and, and now we've got to return to, to being sensible. So it's partially for that reason, but it's also partially for the fact that, you know, the pound takes a, a, a small boost, the stock market takes a small boost, but, but in terms of the structure of the economy, um, we are headed for absolute disaster. And people often in the Conservative Party, or almost always in the Conservative Party, are trying to make the claim of being Thatcherites. But what they forget, and particularly what Liz Truss forgot in the mini budget, was that um, when Thatcher came into power, there were uh, four or even five years of very, very bitter medicine, monetarism, austerity, uh, to get inflation under control and get the public finances under control. And I think Margaret Thatcher was someone that had the steel and the metal to see that through, to take a long-term vision and, and see her long-term vision come to fruition. We don't have politicians like that now. We, you know, it's very rare that you have politicians that look past the, the, the next couple of weeks of headlines. And so that's a major problem as well, that short-termism, you know, short-term market calming, long-term market carnage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and speaking of politicians who only see like the next few weeks of headlines, um, what will be Boris Johnson's legacy as prime minister, given the, since we've, you know, did the last show, he's gone and he's probably, you know, given that he started out so promising, according to many, and floundered out so quickly? Well, I just saw today that, that he announced that he would be attending COP27. And I think, you know, obviously in the recent leadership election, a lot of people were saying, well, we've got to bring Boris back, the, the, the right of the party and the small C conservative movement more widely. There was a lot of supporters uh, for, for bringing Boris back because I think people so wanted to believe that he could be the figure uh, to end Blairism and, and to, you know, reinstill patriotic conservative values into government but he so clearly isn't that you know he's very charismatic he's he's very funny he's very witty um but it was only really that charisma and wit that managed to disguise the fact that um you know we're dealing with another metropolitan liberal globalist so and, and his decision to uh, attend cop 27 when he isn't prime minister uh, when you have you know the the actual prime minister and the king uh, not going, I think, uh, speaks volumes of where his true loyalties lie, or perhaps where his household loyalties lie now. Um, and so I don't think that, uh, you know, Boris was was ever going to be the solution. I think his legacy um, is one of a great missed opportunity. When he came in with the biggest majority since Thatcher, if he had just done what the people wanted, what those voters wanted, you know, it wasn't complicated. Deal with the illegal immigration problem, deal with the mass immigration problem, get the public finances under control, uh, fight the culture war um, against woke rather than for it. Um, don't fall for you know toxic white elephants that are going to bankrupt the country and see uh, the indefatigable rise of China like net zero. Um, and he probably would have governed for a decade at least. Um, so I think it is it, it is for him. It's a, it's a great shame because, you know, he could have probably been one of the most significant prime ministers in British history. Um, as it was, he was part of a 12 year conservative story of, of, of failure and, and con and, and lies to, to the public that put them there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would ask you the same question about um, 
Liz Truss, but I don't see, you know, I don't think it's really worth it given it's essentially like asking about the legs of Alec Douglas tune, they're so little. And I do find it interesting that people say, you know, there was a lot of comparisons and erroneous ones in my opinion, and probably yours as well, on him being sort of a British Trump. Because even as even some people who are critical of Trump, like people who write for Vida.com, for instance, acknowledge that at least there were some measures that someone like Trump put in that did see immigration come down, as opposed to Boris Johnson, who seemed to believe that every single, or his government rather, that, to believe that every single major crisis where the international domestic required more immigration. So there's that as well. And one thing I wanted to ask you on that as well is um, how strong an influence do you think his wife Carrie had on proceedings, especially given that your group, the Bow Group, sorry, the think tank you run rather, were calling for an inquiry at the time into her alleged role in running Downing Street's affairs? Oh, there's a, a lot of questions there. Um, no, I don't think that, um, that the title of Britain's Trump was ever, I think it was um, too great an honour to Boris Johnson. It was something that Trump himself said, although it was only a few weeks ago that Trump uh, said on GB News that Boris is woke and the guys lost it. Um, we, you know, we we uh, were working with people at, in the Trump administration during his his presidency, and were warning him. You know, obviously, we wanted to see a trade deal done, and and we wanted to see a closer partnership between Britain and the United States. But we were warning him. You know, this this guy is not uh, is not part of. The, Trump was looking over and saying, "Why isn't Nigel and, and Boris working together? They seem like you know they're they're great guys. They seem like they they believe the same kinds of things." And we were saying, "Well, no, actually, they believe very very different things." Um, Boris uh, really was was riding uh, Farage's train rather than the other way around. Boris jumped on Brexit, um, but he I don't think he ever really believed in it, and I don't think he he, he believes in the movement that surrounded it. But you know, going back to the point about Trump. Um, the Overton window has shifted and is shifting so quickly uh, to the left that um, whilst people categorise Trump and indeed people like Suella Braven as, as, as being, you know, worse than the Nazis and, 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 you know, as far right as you can possibly imagine. Um, if you actually look at the policy agenda of, of Donald Trump, um, I would argue it was to the left of Clinton and far to the left of, of JFK. Or a figure like that, you know, Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act banning same-sex marriage. You know, if Trump had done that, I don't know what would have happened. Um, but I'd imagine the whole of, of the United States would have um, gone into the same sort of anarchistic uproar as it as it did with the um, Antifa and BLM riots. Bill Clinton talked about the necessity for border security, and Bill Clinton was a fiscal conservative. If you look at Bill Clinton's um, Treasury record at the time he was in office. Um, he was one of the last presidents to really, um, you know, not borrow unsustainably. So um, we we live in this very odd world with, with a very, very short memory um, where somehow the darlings of the left, Bill Clinton and JFK in the United States, um, are, are heralded. Um, but their policy agenda, what they actually did, is ignored. And it's the same point I make in the United Kingdom about Boris governing to the left of, of Blair. You know, if you look at taxation, if you look at spending, if you look at borrowing, if you look at the immigration figures, if you look at, um, you know, the, the quote unquote woke agenda that has flourished over the last decade, it's, it's all stuff that I don't think Tony Blair would have done and Tony Blair would have felt was, was too left wing. So we live in this, in this sort of Twitter reality where, you know, you can throw out these sound bites, fascist, far right, all of these things without actually doing any proper analysis of policy. And I think it's completely skewed and mixed up where people sit. So even though uh, I don't think Boris and Trump are the same, neither do I think Boris and Trump are where the mainstream media position them in the, in the political um, quadrant of you know left right authoritarian libertarian mm -hmm. and uh a quick aside if i may do you think that um on the blair point do you think that actually someone like boris is to the left of blair in terms of policy views or do you think that when actually blair was in power he probably him or maybe some of his cronies had those sort of beliefs that you know have come among the left now but they wouldn't have dared implemented them back in the late 90s when such stuff was 
hell of a lot more controversial than it would be today, do you think? Or is it just... He, well, he I think more, that, yeah. that very approach has been one of the great victories of the progressive left in that they've sold the idea that things must keep getting more left-wing over time. So, you know, it's the current year argument. It's 2022. There, there has to be trans bathrooms. How can there not be trans bathrooms? It's 2022. We've moved on from, you know, 2012. Um, but if you study history, there's what, one of my favourite paintings is Dance of the Music of Time, which is the Wallace Collection, Pusa, and it shows that civilization and society is generally cyclical. And you can see that going throughout history, you know, the, you can look at the, the puritanical nature of the Victorians and the, the debauched nature of the Romans. And um, things in, in both a cultural and a fiscal sense um, don't move in a linear way left or right. Um, it's, it's even not quite perfectly secular. It tends to be more sporadic even than that. But, but I think this idea that, uh, oh, oh, well, yes, you could... You, you wouldn't have been able to get away with that in the 90s, but you can um, in 2022 is based on that on that false premise that um, you know the progressive agenda is inevitable. But in terms of Blair's own position, um, he did an interview I remember for Good Morning Britain. It was in his in the I think it was at the heart of lockdown, and his hair like like mine and his he didn't have a beard, but his hair had gone sort of a bit mullety. And that's why people remember it. But in that interview, um, I believe he said that um, that you know he doesn't he doesn't get a lot of the the woke stuff, and he he's not he's not for it. Um, so his political life was really um, much like David Cameron's. He was in opposition to the left of the Labour Party for for most of his time in the Labour Party, and and, and all of his time. In number 10. Um, and I think that strangely gave him a lot of sympathy um, for perhaps not conservative ideas, um, but, a, but, a, but a, a sympathy perhaps for the, the importance of balancing the books and not being fiscally irresponsible, um, but also a cynicism towards a, a lot of the, you know, the, the, what at the time would have been perhaps referred to as cultural Marxism, but would now be referred to as woke as being sort of the worst excesses of the loony left of, of the Labour Party that has now become quite mainstream. So um, I think you'll probably find, you know, if uh, if if Blair um, wiped the slate clean and suddenly popped up as a, as a figure now and laid out his policy agenda, he'd probably, by the mainstream media, be called far right. But I think in the context of um, British history, as Peter Hitchens said, um, you know, he was he, he, he was a, a left wing radical, just not as radical as the left wing radicals of today. Mm -hmm. And two quick aside before I move on to my next question. I remember the interview you're talking about, the one where had the mullet, where to me he looked like the, if anyone gets the reference, I don't know, the tall man from Phantasm, the bad guy for that film. If you look it up, you'll see what I mean. And I do find it interesting, the other side is that there was a documentary quite a while back, I remember watching a BBC one about the Blair Revolution or whatever. And when he was asked specifically about, it, you know, he was asked and a bunch of his people were asked, what do you believe in? They were just a bit like, they couldn't really give an answer, which I found very interesting. So the next question I wanted to ask you, getting back to something we discussed earlier, when we're talking about the failure, I don't want to discuss Boris all night, but I just think I want to lead into other things with this. Is that, um, do you think one of the major failings is the fact that his wife had a lot of handling of proceedings, Carrie Simmons, especially given being, you know, the Bow Group have called, called for an inquiry into a, a handling of number 10 matters. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I very much think that inquiry should still take place because like the intervention we made recently um, with regard to Sunak's appointment as, as prime minister, I think the integrity of our constitution, the integrity of our democracy is extremely important. And when people are looking on, uh, the, when the public are looking on and seeing, you know, unelected, unaccountable figures, um, clearly, clearly, I mean, when we when we intervened and said this, it was very controversial. And we got a lot of flack from people that now agree with us that, that you know, we, we, we had certain amounts of, of inside information as to what was going on. but 
we came out and said we think there's a real problem here and it needs to be investigated and that was long before Dominic Cummings had come out and and, and long before a lot of the other you know number 10 staffers both political and civil servants have come out and identified the problem um, and I think it's now very clear uh, that for whatever reason Carrie Simmons as she was then felt that she had a role to play in deciding um, you know how government was staffed and and you know what what who should be in government positions and also to challenge um a lot of rightfully appointed um government figures uh government decision makers and indeed elected officials um and and to push a different policy agenda and i think that that the very fact that that happened in a modern democracy is absolutely extraordinary um you know you can some people made the the comparisons to hillary clinton some people made the comparisons to marie antoinette but um in the case of, of hillary clinton in the united states obviously you do have an official role there in in that of first lady and there was nothing like the level of accounts of interference um that that was reported to have been going on in Downing Street indeed I think Dominic Cummings described it as illegal um which I don't think that that point was ever made specifically about Hillary Clinton's role in in decision making in the White House so it's quite an extraordinary thing that happened in our history and I think it will be remembered and I think it should be even now properly investigated because uh, you know it's 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 simply not good enough um to say oh well you know you know how it works behind closed doors and all that sort of thing you know the the age of deference i think is past and you know the the, the tagline of of the of the brexit campaign take back control not um install uh, sort of medieval style court um unelected decision makers to govern the country so i i yeah i i think it's um it's just as as big an issue as it ever was and it needs investigating like it like it ever did and i think um the faith that the public have in our democracy, you know, been building up for a long time. It, it dropped very significantly with the Brexit referendum when it wasn't being implemented. And it was very clear that, you know, Parliament was 70% Remain and government was 70% Remain. And there were a lot of you know, very serious voices saying it should just be ignored because the people don't know what they're doing. Um, and then we've had, you know, these series of events. We had the, the carry incident and then we've had a, you know, and it was an issue with Theresa May as well. And then we've had, you know, a succession of leaders that have that have come through that haven't been elected or endorsed by the public. The system of democracy within the Conservative Party is extremely questionable, which the Bow Group has been questioning for a very long time. And I think a feeling has grown up uh, um, that, that had been brewing for a long time, but is probably at fever pitch now, that, um, you know, the elites and the establishment decide who runs this country and what the policies are rather than the people. Uh, and that's a very sad state for, for a paragon of democracy like Britain to be in. I think we need to fight back against it tooth and claw. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons I ask you that question is because I got finished reading this book, this very excellent book actually by Michael Ashcroft, which you were mentioning funnily enough. And one thing I found interesting- well, I, I haven't actually read it, but maybe I should. Oh yeah, it's excellent. Don't worry. Um, it, and my old website, Political Light, that I used to work on, had pictures in it, which I found quite nice. But anyway, um, one thing I found interesting in it, relating to Carrie specifically, was the fact that it talked about you asking you and you, your group, sorry, rather talking about this inquiry, and in response, you you hinted about this earlier about a lot of the sexism allegations, but then some of the people who were making these allegations that are then the same ones to go. We actually need to formalize, you know, the first. The lady role. So why is it? So I don't get. Why do you think that such people aren't more honest about their aims, given how blatantly obvious they are? Especially when I don't think many people, you know, normies buy the whole Eastern phobe culture anymore. At least not as much as they used to. I don't think. No, I mean, I, I, I was one of one of the early cancellations on the ism, phobe and ist uh, lineup. You know, because I was speaking out against the LGBT lobby before it was fashionable. Um, and it was taken that if you were speaking uh, against the LGBT lobby at the time, uh, you must hate gay people and, you know, 
you must uh, be a homophobe or, or, or transphobe or any of these other things. Um, and, you know, we've seen the, the, the same card that if you criticize BLM, you're a racist. If you criticize any, any uh, woman in a position of power, or indeed not in an official position of power in this case, you're a sexist. But as you rightly say, I think uh, the public see through that now. Um, and, and there is very much a boy who cried wolf element to it. And I, I, I wrote an article about this, the boy who cried woke, which is that we've unfortunately reached a situation where you know, words like fascist and Nazi and racist and, and homophobe and sexist are thrown around so freely now, um, you know, in, in not only forum like, like Twitter and social media, but, but in mainstream media and, and indeed by government spokespeople. Um, the idea that, that criticising someone that is unelected, unappointed, unaccountable in, in, in Downing Street is sexism. Is, is obviously absolute risible nonsense. And I actually think it, it, it did them no good at all because that card had been worn out before they started to play it. And I think people just thought, well, if that's their argument, they don't have an argument. There's clearly a, a, a serious problem here. And in terms of the advocacy for the first lady position, um, you had, I think, for the first time with, with Carrie Simmons, and this was before she was actually married. She, in fact, I think at the time, um, she, the, Boris Johnson was still married to uh, his, his former wife, mm. uh, but was, was living with, with Carrie Simmons. And, and, and uh, she was given a member of, an official member of staff that I think, I could be wrong about this, I'm trying to remember. I, I think it was that they initially tried to. Um, th there was an there was an attempt to get a funded member of staff, I think, and in the end, it ended up being paid by the Conservative Party mm. uh, rather than from from taxpayers' funds. Um, and you know that was that was a, a new thing that hadn't really gone before. Obviously, we've had some very prominent wives of of, of prime ministers, very formidable wives and husbands of, of prime ministers I remember you know Dennis Thatcher was uh you know was was his own man and and a very successful man in his own right but none of those figures sort of required their own funded taxpayers office or funded by the conservative party or funded by anyone you know it was just sort of uh taken that the British way of doing things was that you may happen to be married to the prime minister and you carry on with your your business and you may accompany them to certain events and may not to certain other events, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a public position. Um, and I think there was a, the, the, the basis of the desire during Carrie Simmons' time in Downing Street, I think was an attempt to legitimise herself rather than legitimise that position, because I don't think it needs legitimising. The Prime Minister is not the head of state. We, we have a monarch and one recently sadly passed and mm. um, the, 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 the monarch and their spouse and their royal family, they are the heads of, of, of state. And, you know, I think that's right. And uh, I don't I don't think the, the prime minister's spouse should have any po po political role, really. It's not it's not part of our system. Um, it's not part of our tradition. And I don't see any value to it. And so, yes, I think it was just an attempt to um, try and make something that isn't a political role, a political role and then derive influence from it and and to shoot down any critics of it as, as being sexist. It was the most absurd, risible, uh, ridiculous of affairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I move on, actually, that is an excellent book, by the way. And um, the picture it paints of Carrie, and to be fair, it's a pretty balanced picture, I think, is one where she's essentially heavily, you know, heavily much somebody who wants to get to the top jobs in any sort of position but doesn't seem to really put in the graft it seems but that's just a picture i get from the book i've no i haven't met her or anything like that the next thing i wanted to ask actually and this is um something else to do with carry i'll be in a lesser way and it's you hinted at it earlier relating to your cancellation so to speak was that another matter on carry is of course her involvement in the tatlatory scandal something we discussed in the last time yeah. but i don't think we didn't i don't think we went into as much as i would have liked given how significant it was and how to me anyway how not how underreported it was considering the significance of it. To those who are unfamiliar with the matter, explain what happened and just a quick warning here, maybe a not safe for work message should be left here just given how disturbing some of this stuff gets. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very um, dark story, not, not, you know, probably not 
uh, anything to do with um with 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 my sort of victim status in it but but you know it it, it led to um the the death of, of a young activist elliot johnson and uh it's it, yeah i mean even even to talk about it, it was it was 2015 so it's going on for a, for a decade ago now and i still really can't believe that it happened um but but the tatlatory scandal was was really a scandal that involved um a group of people that had formed a conservative central office who uh, could loosely be described as a sort of dirty tricks operation um, or you know a smear campaign uh, political heavies however however you want to describe it. I described it as gangster politics at, at the time where um, you know one of the central figures in it um, who became known as the Tatlatory I actually think unfairly because you know he, he he's a bad guy but he was following orders from his superiors was a, was a was a guy called Mark Clark um, and he and a number of others would essentially go and threaten people, including myself, and, and say, you know, unless you do X, Y, Z, or you stop doing X, Y, Z, which in my case was um, was writing about the Westminster paedophile scandal and writing about uh, some of the figures involved in it and, um, you know, criticising a lot of the things that were going on in Conservative Central Office, in, including the formation of this this group um, that I would be smeared in the press um, and then um, removed for the, for the Conservative Party. What I didn't let on at the time was I wasn't actually a member of the Conservative Party. And so they had absolutely no basis by which to be doing any of this stuff at all. I, don't, I mean, I don't think they would if you were a member of the Conservative Party, but you know, they were essentially trying to threaten me into, into silence. And you know, I robustly fought back. I published articles detailing what they had done and what they were doing. Um, but unfortunately, some of the other people involved that were in touch with me were, um, I mean, I was fairly young at the time. I must have been in my late twenties. Um, and obviously you're, you know, you're, you're being threatened by the Conservative Party and the, you know, they were speaking on, on the authority of the chairman of the Conservative Party, the prime minister of the day. So it's, in, it's intimidating for anyone. Um, but some of the younger activists involved were, were, you know, in their early 20s or in some cases in their teens. And there was a there was a sexual aspect to it in that people were being pressurised into sleeping with um, uh, senior figures and, and, and members of parliament and so forth and were being bullied into silence. Uh, and unfortunately, um the, the 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 pressure that that exerted on one young activist led uh, them to take their own life and, and and they um you know laid that out in their in their suicide note and in, in the information that, that they left behind that it, it was um it was the act of that suicide that 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 brought the issue to a head um and ultimately uh the two chairman of the Conservative Party had to resign along with um, Mark Clark and Paul Abbott and a large number of other figures. Um, Carrie Simmons, as she was then, was, was significantly involved, but the investigation into it that was commissioned by the Conservative Party to um, be conducted by a law firm um, redacted uh, most of the information relating to that and According to reports, uh, Carrie was was um, later fired from um, Conservative Centre Office for uh, what was reported to be fraud. Um, but um, that's not something I have. That was, a, you know, this is based on a on a Daily Mail piece that that reported on that. But that's not something I had direct experience of. Um, what I uh, experience was was yeah the the, the tablatory scandal and, and I, I don't think any of those individuals involved from Clark to Grant Schatz who was chairman of the Conservative Party and he was probably acting under the orders of of Cameron I don't think any of them have have a place in politics and certainly uh, they should be nowhere near politics um, if they have no oversight accountability um, or mechanism to investigate and, and remove them because um, you know these are really they're very dangerous dangerous people and and um, their 
their actions, I would, there was no criminal prosecutions that, that followed. It's often very difficult to, you know, get witnesses and, 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 and gather evidence. But I think the, if people are interested and want to research it, um, whilst uh, I agree with you that it, that it wasn't, uh, it didn't receive the coverage that it should have given the darkness and the extent of the scandal, um, there's a lot of information out there and it, um, it's a very, it's a very troubling story, uh, and I encourage you know those that that, that are interested to, to look into it for themselves and draw their own conclusions. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, quick aside about that, and this is pretty grim detail actually of the whole thing. There's actually a, I only found this through the Data Beast, funnily enough. There's a Spectator article that was deleted by one of your favourites, also Harry Cole, where Clark jokes about the road trip thing which is linked to all this, being a quote-unquote dating agency pretty much for him. It's, you know, the article's deleted now, but it's safe for archive. And uh, one thing I wanted to ask you from that is that you were t- we talk about how unreported it was, Sans, you know, the BBC admittedly doing a very good job exposing some of this stuff. Why is it do you think that it was heavily underreported then, given the fact that to this day, I mean, we saw this in a Piers Morgan interview a couple of years ago, people still remember UKIP counselors saying stupid things about gay people hanging around with dodgy characters and Nigel Farage is lectured on these people but so David Cameron's ever asked about this sort of stuff especially when it seems like he you know he was foot fir- feet first into it so what do you think this didn't get the coverage it should have had at the time well I, I, w- I was told by senior patrons of the Bay Group who you know are very senior politicians have very distinguished careers that David Cameron contacted them personally um, and asked them to attack me publicly and and, and uh, to attempt to oust me from the Bow Group. And from all of the information I've seen, there's no question that David Cameron was uh, very significantly involved in this. And that's ultimately where this was flowing from. It was flowing from, from Downing Street to Conservative Central Office. So it was going from Cameron to Shapps, um, who, who was then, um, I believe, passing his orders via intermediaries that were full-time employees at CCHQ to figures like Mark Clark. So um, where it was reported, the you know 90% of the blame was laid at Mark Clark's door, which I think was very unfair because um, Mark Clark, whilst, uh, as you say, um, very questionable character in his own right, he was following the instructions of, of you know, essentially the prime minister. Um, and that is a great scandal in of itself. I think in terms of a lot of the darker elements about it, like the Westminster paedophile stuff that they were trying to suppress, um, it's, a, it's a very curious thing. That issue particularly about um, establishment figures, um, you know, engaging in, in, in paedophilia, as well as what you've seen in Rotherham. Um, for whatever reason, I think there is a, there is a squeamishness amongst the mainstream media to talk about that and to focus on it and to investigate it properly. Um, and I think there is also, it's, it's, it's what I call the Sunday morning problem. So if people are opening their copy of, of the mail on Sunday, on Sunday morning, um, they don't want, you know, this stuff is just too dark uh, really for, for the dissemination in, most mainstream media. You don't want to see this on the six o'clock news. You don't want to read it over breakfast on Sunday. Um, but that doesn't mean that it that it didn't happen and, and, and it does happen. So it's a difficult question as to how the media approach that. I think a lot of them don't want to cover it for more nefarious reasons. And you mentioned figures like Andrew Neil um, and, you know, they, they were involved in it. You know, they were they were um, the, the the people that were carrying out the smears on behalf of the Conservative Party. And of course, the Prime Minister has a lot of very powerful friends, a lot of strings he can pull. Um, and uh, a lot of the media fall in line. It was interesting with the BBC because the, the, it, it was the BBC's daily politics show that they used to what Mark Clark described as a drive by shooting. And he said that before it took place. So they knew that the BBC were going to Perform, attempt to perform this political assassination on myself and the and the Bow Group, and and so you know clearly it was um, it was you know not not uh, anything that the BBC could reasonably do or or 
uh, a public service broadcaster should have been allowed to do. But equally, as you say, other aspects of the BBC, being in this case specifically Newsnight, did look into the matter. So um, whilst generally, you know, for brevity, we talk about the mainstream media and indeed the BBC as a monolith, as not looking into these things. Um, there are parts of the media that do, um, and um, some of them, you know, do it do it very well. So um, I, I hope it's a it's a story that is returned to, and it and it's a story that is told. Obviously, there are um, great sensitivities with regards to Elliot Johnson's family, um, but in my uh, dialogue with with his family, which at the time was was quite extensive they were very keen for as much to come out as as possible so um perhaps you know there will be a book or uh, something in the future about the whole issue and i do think that i think there was another ashcroft book about cameron that did isabel oakshot i think was the author. yeah call, call me dave um, i think it was call me dave yeah and uh, i think there was um, maybe maybe a chapter or, or, or maybe a section that was dedicated to that. But yeah, it's a fascinating, um, it's a, it, it's a, it's a fascinating, I mean, it, it really would, um, things like sort of House of Cards, um, as it was compared to at the time, uh, don't hold a candle to that sort of skullduggery and, and, and tragedy and horror that was going on. So, um, no, I think you're, you're, you're right in saying that, um, there is probably more to explore there and perhaps I will I will do that at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, one one or two more quick slides before we move into something a lot lighter, don't worry, is that um, uh, well, because I read your Twitter account sometimes, funnily enough, like I noticed that Mark Clark was recently, well not recently, 2018 was fired from a job at the City of London, so apparently him being involved in this scandal still gets him, he can still walk into certain places, still get employment for certain things but he's still fired for the same reasons he's fired from other places that's quite interesting and the other thing i wanted to say as well is that it always irks me when people say that because some people do say that david cameron may be a nice chap especially in stuff like that it seems like it, that brings the whole thing into very you know serious doubt but the next thing i wanted to ask you is a lot of more of a lighter question is about this current government is that you were talking about earlier the racist stuff and whatnot, the racist smears. Is that one notable aspect of the party that does look promising is that sort of Swella Braverman being reappointing Home Secretary. And she seems serious about wanting to tackle problems concerning mass immigration and wokeness in our police force. How do you feel about such an appointment, especially since the Bow Group have previously called for someone like Braverman to be been party leader in the past? Well, look, I've said for, for, for a very long time that the left um, have consistently used the, the, the smear of racist against the right in general. And there is no question in my mind that if, you know, the last proper leadership election, not well, it wasn't really proper because you know, it had two candidates, but the last leadership election that, that ended in a vote at least uh, in the Conservative Party, had that been a primary like that which you see in the United States, and uh, rather than MPs whittling it down to a final two candidates, there have been a full breadth of candidates. The so-called octogenarian racist old duffers it, it, that are the Conservative Party members, most of whom are still properly conservative, unlike the leadership of the party, um, there's no doubt that, that they would have either had Kemi Badnock or Suella Braverman as, as leader. And that's nothing to do with their race and entirely to do with the policy agenda that they were laying out that is not only popular with the conservative members uh, but also extremely popular with the voters that delivered the largest majority since thatcher and indeed those who voted for brexit um so well rather than it so happens um once uh, stood for a position in the Bow Group. And I think she was on a, an opposing side to me um, many years ago. And perhaps it's rather a tragedy that she she didn't um, she didn't get it. Um, but um, in recent years, I've been extremely impressed by her bravery. Perhaps people like you with a very strong interest in politics will remember that she was a Spartan. She was one of the mm. very few 
MPs who stood to the last, you know, with figures like Redwood and Cash, the, the, you know, the long-standing uh, Brexiteers to oppose any dilution of, of the Brexit that, that we got. And I think you're seeing that now in her role as Home Secretary. She is close to fearless and the pressure that she is being placed under. I mean, the whole establishment want her gone. I think yesterday it was almost hour by hour, a new scandal came out, a new report into something Suella Braverman has done wrong. And you see the same with, with Trump in the United States. It's, you know, every little, every little I that wasn't dotted, every T that wasn't <laughs> crossed becomes a capital crime. And, you know, oceans of legal cases, oceans of, of scandals. But the only response to that is what I describe as post-apology politics. It's just to say, no, I'm not. I'm not going to resign. Um, these are the things I believe in. Let the public decide whether that's what they want or not. And I think you will find that, despite all of the, the headwinds, despite all of the smears that are being thrown at Suella, um, her popularity among uh, conservative voters will only rise and I think you're talking about in one form or another a future leader um, perhaps of the Conservative Party perhaps of another party but but certainly a very prominent figure and um, I think the fact that you know she's from a minority ethnic background uh, the same with with Rishi Sunak uh, the same with anyone really I don't think the country and I don't think the Conservative movement care about that at all I think they care only about the values and I think I was having this conversation with 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 someone who who uh, has just set up the, the black conservatives network and a lot of the strongest small c conservatives now in the conservative party are from BAME backgrounds and I think the reason for that is they got through on the A list whereas if they hadn't been from BAME backgrounds they would have been stopped because of their views but because the, the Cameron and Gove A-list was so desperate to draw in more women, more ethnic minority backgrounds, um, a lot of proper conservatives got through that they didn't they didn't realise. You know, people like Priti Patel, people like Suella Bravo, and people like Kemi Badnock, um, and I think those people are going to be the future of uh, conservatism in the Conservative Party. And um, I think the left and perhaps the mainstream media and perhaps a lot of people in the Conservative Party will be surprised at how uh, little race is a barrier to, to their popularity and success. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, admittedly, maybe I'm a little bit biased because I actually met Braverman once and she was very polite to me, even though I um, couldn't remember her name very briefly, I don't know why. Um, but on the thing you're talking about just now is that the hostile reaction to the to the appointment but uh, in turn reflects a pro mass immigration attitude among the elites of who approves Braverman because she's against it why do you think that despite brexit to borrow a phrase of the bbc out uh, i'll be in a different way and every election results since 2015 having shown such huge public discontent for more immigration why do the elite continue so you know to favor it so much do you think even within the conservative party well, it goes back long before 2015. If you look at polling, uh, concerns over immigration, both legal and illegal, and that is an important point to make. It's not just illegal immigration, it's the sheer scale of immigration, what you would describe as mass immigration. There's been a top three um, concern for voters at every election for two decades now. Um, and I think the feeling is among most of the British public, as it is, for me, that um, I'm pro-immigration, anti-mass immigration, uh, because I think the sort of the levels of immigration that Britain had throughout 99% of, of its, or certainly these islands had throughout 99.9% .9 of, of our history was both sustainable and beneficial. Um, so, you know, we've always been a country that's been welcoming to um, people from, from foreign lands, and we've always been, been a country that I think was, you know, looking to the horizons and, and being open-minded. Um, but what has happened really since the mid nineties, and you can look at this on graphs and you can look at the data, the sheer scale mm. of shift is not something that has ever been seen in human history. And, you know, when people are calling Suella Braverman a fascist, 
um, you know, I'm supportive of what she's trying to do. But the fact is, under this Conservative Party, and indeed currently under this Home Secretary, she hasn't had a chance to fix it, but, but we have the highest numbers of legal and illegal immigration than had ever been in any government in history. So what people are calling fascist is actually the highest level of immigration in history, way more than under Labour, way more than any under any government in history. And uh, clearly, there is a very strong establishment view and narrative that they don't they not only want to keep that, but they want to increase it mm. from from there. Um, and you can debate why that is. Some people believe it is a it, it is a globalist agenda stemming from places like Davos to disintegrate the nation state and disintegrate national identity. Um, and, you know, by by having this sort of globalist hegemony. So every capital city looks the same, has the same shops, has the same outlets, has the same demographic mix. Um, I think that, you know, that there's there's a lot to be said from that for that when you look at uh, what some of the proponents of this stuff, um, leading figures in the European Union, uh, leading establishment figures across the West are saying, I think um, there's clearly a strong narrative there. But I also think that big corporations who have a lot of hooks into government love cheap labour. Um, and, you know, what we've done is we've created an economy in the United Kingdom where growth is really fueled by population increase. So most of our growth over recent years, top line growth, uh, has been fueled by um, population increase. On the same period, that two to three decades of mass immigration, you've seen standards of living decline. So, but I don't know how old you are, but you look pretty young. Uh, I, just, I was actually born just slightly after Blair got into office, so... Just yeah, well, just before just before OK Computer came out as well. So nice symmetry, so, I suppose. So for for I mean, I'm I'm technically a millennial. I know I look like I'm in the late nineties, but, oh, but that's fine. I'm I'm uh, I'm a millennial, and for the generation of millennials and those coming through, um, things like buying a house in your twenties and arguably thirties things that for my parents were not only achievable but standard um, are no longer in the grasp of the vast majority of people for example where i live um a, a four-bedroom house with a you know sort of a new built four-bedroom house with a postage stamp garden will go for 800 to nine hundred thousand pounds you know and if you if you're in your 20s and 30s you want to start a family you want to have three children you've got to be earning in the top 1% of earners to do that. It's not something that is available anymore for ordinary people. Um, and I think that demonstrates how stark that shift in living standards has been. So you can talk about, oh, it's great. We've got, you know, we're, the economy is growing. The economy is bigger than it ever was. But it doesn't mean anything if that's not delivering an increase in standard of living for, for the citizenry. And it's not only not delivering that, it's delivering a very steep and I think unsustainable decline. Um, so what I would advocate is for what the Conservative Party promised, which is to reduce immigration to the tens of thousands. I would say at this point, because we've had nigh on three decades of it, that needs to be gross, not net. Um, and I think we, we need to actually uh, look at a, a situation in Britain where the population starts to decline. We need to incentivize people to have more children to balance out the demographics. Um, but I think we, we, um, you know, we are a small island. Um, I always find it quite extraordinary that generally the green lobby and environmentalists are, are pro the environment, but you know want to concrete over uh, as much Britain as possible to provide homes for uh, the the incoming migrant population. Um, but I believe we need to maintain um, the heritage of Britain, uh, natural habitat, and, and I think there are already, frankly, too high a population on these islands, certainly in the southeast, which I think is one of the most densely populated 
places on earth. So I would advocate a completely different strategy that focuses on standards of living rather than uh, simple top line GDP growth, which doesn't deliver for the public. And I think you, you, know, you can talk about Suella Brotherman, but you can also talk about how the establishment in general reacts to figures like Viktor Orban, who in Hungary have gone for a, a, a very, um, uh, I think, strong policy on, on migration. It's, it's still a cosmopolitan country. You know, Budapest is one of the, one of the nicest cities on earth. It's, it's, it's still a multicultural population, but they're far, far stricter on migration and they're far, far stronger uh, on encouraging uh, Hungarians to have more children and to have big families. And, and it's quite extraordinary that that's become controversial because, you know, through the entirety of human history, that is how everything functioned. Um, so I think you can you can know the aims of these people by by who they attack. And if they were if they are calling someone fascist who is who is merely really talking about ending an illegal trade in migration and human trafficking, uh, then you know you can you can see that truth has departed and there is clearly an agenda um, that. Um, figures across the media classes, across the political classes are desperate to push and install. That would include presumably senior Tories like Sir Roger Gow, who apparently thinks that Brotherman is a flaming far-right rhetoric, but this is the same Roger Gow, of course, who back in, I think, March said that essentially all Russians should be kicked out of the UK because of what Vladimir Putin, you know, is doing in Ukraine, which seems to me to be a bit of a huge contradiction, but, it, you know, um, make of that what you will, and Another thing I noticed was that last last night or a couple of days ago, the ONS has announced they're going to be hiding the foreign born and national origin part of their statistics when it comes to the census. So, the the, the Bo Group did a did a study a few years ago based on ONS figures that found that eighty two percent of new British citizens were either foreign born or born to a foreign parent, and that was based on those very figures that they're talking about discontinuing. And I think if you look at a figure like that. You extrapolate that several decades into the future, and this country um, is is you know in the space of really a lifetime has changed more demographically than it has in the entire history of, of these islands. And I don't think there's anyone that really knows what the outcome of that will be. I think you're talking about ending Britain as a as a country. Some people think that's a positive thing, of course. Um, but I think that even if you are someone who thinks that, um, you know, there should be open borders, immigration and, and has no issue with every city on earth being the same and having the same demographics. And that's what you want to see. I don't think even those people know what the unintended consequences of this will be. And um, you know, I do very much think there's a there's a strong element of be careful what you wish for, because Britain, for all its problems, and indeed the United States for all its problems, and France for all its problems, you know, these are countries in which the citizenry achieved a level of, of freedom and prosperity that had never been seen before, really, in history. And I think with these sorts of radical shifts that occur in a very short-term basis in the context of history are very much in danger of, of trashing all of that. And, you know, obviously, as a conservative, the heart of conservatism is, is really trying to preserve the great things that we have inherited. And our nation and our nationhood, I think, is, is one of them. And it's under threat. Um, and I, I, you know, going back to the point that we were making about Suella Braverman and others, um, it's, it's not a racial thing. And I think at this point, it has almost nothing to do with race. You know, it is, it is really a question of culture. Some of the greatest um, and, and strongest adherents of small C conservatism and, and nationhood of my generation and around my generation are people from a BAME background. People like Suella Braverman, my friend Raheem Kassam, Calvin Robinson, these these figures um, that you know have have become uh, very potent defenders of, of nationhood and and British history, um, 
And I think, you know, there's a recognition, ironically, in a lot of migrant communities, that there's something in this country that's worth preserving and not tearing apart on all sorts of tracks with mass immigration, with the woke agenda, um, you know, with the, the disintegration, destruction of a lot of our institutions. Um, so I think it's part of a, a very important battle. But I also think that if you study the figures, um, the, the pace of change is so great that um, it's not something that can be, um, it's not something that can be reversed. Um, and I think it's something that is going to cause a lot of a lot of problems in our lifetimes that we're going to have to witness and, and, and probably deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that, actually, the next question I wanted to ask you was, um, what would your, and you discussed this earlier, but if you could give essentially just maybe a TLDR version, I suppose, just in case there are any conservative representatives watching, what would be your, what would be the Bogart's advice to, uh, to this current conservative government if they were to, if to win the next general election, what would you suggest the main sort of things they should do be like, be, maybe beyond immigration and beyond balance of the books, like, what other major tenants would you think they should enact? Well, I think uh, what the Brexit vote demanded, in Michael Gove said at the time, it was a great vote of confidence in our parliamentary system. And I don't think it was at all. I think it was the removal of an excuse because so many MPs would go around, whether they liked it or not, saying, oh, we can't do that because it's the EU or it's the ECHR. Um, I think what we need to see in this country now is very significant democratic and institutional reform. And this is why the Reform Party changed its name from the Brexit Party to the Reform Party. Um, I think we need to see, as we've, we've touched on before, um, a, a switch to a primary system in, in all political parties. So the, the, the people are in direct charge of who the candidates are that represent them as they have in the United States. Um, and I think we need to see a switch to proportional representation um, so that you know, all views in the United Kingdom are, are reflected in our parliament. And there's not this feeling that there's an establishment and elite and the, and the public can't control what they're doing. Um, and I think you know, institutions like the House of Lords in the form that they have become, which is essentially a, a, a crony donor mill um, that is now the largest uh, democratically elected chamber on earth. I think that needs to be changed into an elected chamber or, or a, a completely different system because the system at the moment is completely indefensible. Um, and I think we need a Bill of Rights to replace um, uh, the, the membership of the ECHR. And I think absolutely central to that Bill of Rights which is, which is an easy thing to say, but I actually think it's probably the most important issue of all is enshrining freedom of speech in law in Britain in, in a, a way that is so robust that it becomes the case that people can say anything about anything without any fear of, of judicial uh, reprisal. Um, so if the Conservative Party was able to achieve that, um, then I think that would probably be greater than the achievements of, of, of Thatcher. Um, it would certainly be up there in the pantheon. If, if, if you look at sort of Chat Thatcher and Churchill and Disraeli as being the great figures of the Conservative Party, I think any leader who was able to instill that reform agenda and essentially give control of Britain back to the public and make democracies something that was alive again and that people really felt that their vote mattered and their voice mattered, then that's probably the most important thing that, that any government could do. There are many other issues, but you asked for a TLDR version. <laughs> so that's that's what I would say. Fair enough, yeah, sure. And the penultimate question I wanted to ask you, um, admittedly, sorry, it's another slightly dark one, but I think this is, you know, something also important that I really can't just, you know, ignore given it's happened since you were last on. Is that one final point on the Tory specifically? In a national pulse, pulse, sorry, in a national pulse podcast that you did with Raheem Kassam a year ago, you discussed the then recent murder of Sir David Amos by an Islamist terrorist, whereby you noted that such political violence had returned, quote unquote, with a vengeance. 
Given the seeming significance of that event and the MP in question, forgive me for this is a bit loaded. Why has the incident alongside others of its kind for that matter, especially Reading in 2020, have been so quickly memory hold by the establishment, if you don't mind me using such a loaded term, because that's what seems to have happened? I think it has and it hasn't. It has been memory hold in the sense of the motivations, uh, you know, the true motivations, I think. And, um, you know, the fact that, that David Amos was murdered uh, for his political views um, by a terrorist. And, um, you know, that strangely um, has become, I think, a difficult issue to accept and is a challenge to multiculturalism in, in many ways in a multi-faith society. It hasn't been, been memory hold in the sense that I think politicians, you know, if you look at the online safety bill and there was calls to to call it after David Amos, which I, I personally think was a horrific um, and uh, a very cynical move because I don't think David Amos would have actually supported a lot of, of course, he's not here to, to speak for himself, but mm. you know, from, from my experience of him and his political views, I don't think he would have supported censorship. So there's been an attempt to sort of confect this issue from a, a member of parliament being murdered for their political views to, uh, someone criticizing a member of parliament on Twitter, mm. for example. Um, so so the, the, the debate has been steered in that direction. I think that's quite wrong. Um, we, we spoke about Elliot Johnston before. In, in my life, in my political life, um, a, a fair few of, of colleagues, of people I've known and friends are dead. Um, and they're, they're dead because of their their role in politics. And I myself have received, you know, a, a, a large number of death threats over the years. And in fact, one uh, last year was extremely specific and detailed that, that you know, would, would lead me to believe that it is not merely a spurious uh, throwaway point. And I think um, we are entering a period generally where the, the emergence of, of, of violence and discord, I think is, you're right to call it dark because it is moving in a dark direction. And places or nations that were once considered very stable and safe, I think are, are moving away from, from that. Um, and, you know, we're entering uh, a, 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 a period, I think, where you know our politics and politics in the United States and politics in Europe are becoming more like the politics we have seen in the third world. So we are seeing uh, judicial activism. We are seeing administrations coming in and prosecuting and attempting to lock up the last administration. We are seeing people being murdered for their political views and, and, and we are seeing, you know, both violent assassinations and uh, sort of cancellation, political assassinations taking place. And we are seeing a level of hatred, I think, um, that is not about mere debate or, or difference of values, but I think it is, you know, a violent hatred that I often, when I look at some of the vitriol directed at me or, you know, in, in a much more uh, significant sense d directed at Suella Braverman or, or you know, figures that are, that are much more high profile. Um, and I genuinely believe that a lot of those people, such is their level of hatred and vitriol, that if they could kill the person, they would. Um, I, I, and, and, you know, it's happened quite slowly. You, as you say, were, were, were born in the late nineties. But this sort of thing, you know, we, we, we've had terrorism in this country for a long time, certainly. But this sort of vitriol and, and hatred and sort of glee in the destruction of the opposition, I think is fairly new. It's something that's come up over the last decade or so. Um, and David Amos, you know, is, is a very important part of that story. You know, I knew David, he 
he was involved in the baby group longer than longer than I was. Um, and um, a, a great man, uh, a, a great conservative, big part of the of the Thatcher revolution. And his death is an absolute tragedy and one that, that should be remembered um, and should be remembered in the right way rather than an excuse for, for government to increase its powers. Um, it should be remembered in a, in a way of, um, a, a, as a marker of how our society is failing mm -hmm. and, and how we are headed to, to darkness in that way. Sorry to hear about the death threats, by the way. And uh, one little thing I wanted to say on that before I move on to the final question was that um, I do find it interesting that when talking about violence and all the rest of it, there was that dreadful incel shooting in Devon last year. I'm not going to mention the killer because I don't want to give him the, the, the attention, quite frankly. But after that happened, whether you like the response or not, there was at least a political response, gun laws were looked into and all the rest of it. But at the same time, when the thing happened with Amos, you, you're right, you know, there was lo looking into online censorship, but nothing about Islamic terrorism, you know, still, yeah. even though we've had so many instances on this source at 7 7, it's just staggering. I don't know, but yeah, that's maybe a subject for another time, I suppose. But on a more positive final note, you're, on your last appearance on this show, you were very critical of the recently launched GB News Network. Since then, you and many of the Bogus representatives have appeared on it, and you have recently written a, about the network positively for the Mallard, a publication I also write for, forgive me for shameless plugging. What caused this change in your attitude, and what does its success, especially in comparison to its rival talk TV, speak to when it comes to the state of the British media nowadays? Well, yes. Um, I mean, I, I said at the time that um, it was very clear that there were there were two competing visions for GB News. One was held by Andrew Neil, which was, uh, you know, really in its sort of an extension of Spectator TV. So it was going to be very establishment and, uh, you know, neoliberal um, and probably not speaking so much to the Red Wall voters, but speaking to Tufton Street. And I said at the time that that could never, I mean, there's obviously still an element of that on GB News, but I said at the time that that could never work because whilst the, the sort of the neoliberal organisations, um, you know, some of which I agree with on some issues, but the fact is, whilst they have huge amounts of funding, they represent a tiny sect of the public. You know, these are not the issues that the public care about, sort of deregulation of, of you know, financial rules and, and rules of commerce and, and low taxes even. Um, the issues that the public are clearly passionate about are more on the cultural sphere. Um, and, you know, if you watch GB News now, after Andrew Neil left and, and Frangopoulos took complete control, who, who you know, was, was previously at Sky News Australia, and we'd worked with Sky News Australia in the past, and Andrew Bolton indeed, um, some people from, from Sky News Australia did uh, internships at the Bow Group. So we were in touch with them and, and giving our views on what we thought GB News needed to be. And Andrew Neil was the barrier to that. And, you know, I think we all saw what happened. And I think it was very much um, for the best. I don't think GB News would have lasted were, were it not for that. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not um, partisan with regards to GB News or Talk TV. I celebrate it, even though I, <laughs> I, I uh, like most things, I haven't benefited from it financially. But what I was doing with Raheem um, at, at Breitbart London back in, in 2014, a lot of the narratives that we were pushing that you did not see anywhere else in the mainstream media, I saw that globalism was trending the other day on Twitter. You never saw that in, in, in the mainstream media, well, at least not anywhere near to the extent that it is talked about today on outlets like GB News and Talk TV. Um, those, those narrative points that we were talking about have now become mainstream via channels like GB News and Talk TV, and they've become mainstream for a very simple reason. It's because that is what you know, whatever you want to call them, your Red Bull voters, your Brexit voters, your small C conservative voters, were talking about and thinking about. And we knew that because we mixed in those circles, but it just wasn't reflected in the mainstream media. So I think what has happened is over the last decade, there has been a media revolution that has given 
a lot of those people a voice. And despite the naysayers, um, I think if you look at the numbers, shows like Nigel Farage um, beat out pretty much everything else at the same time on any other channel. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that finally their views are being represented. And it's quite an extraordinary story, you know, when you think about the that when we last spoke about it, not that long ago, you know, it was Andrew Neil's pet project and it was completely wrested away from him and, and um, I think brought to, brought to showcase the genuine views of the small C conservative Brexit movement. And I also don't think, perhaps it's wishful thinking, but I don't think there's any way back. I don't think we'll ever go back to the point where all you've got is BBC News or Sky or Channel 4 that are all saying the same things. Um, you know, one of the, there's a book called Rise of the Outsiders, um, which I very much believe in the truth of. And what we see in the, in the, in the Bow Group and other surrounding organisations is that 10 years ago, everyone getting involved in think tanks and political organizations wanted to be an MP one day mm. that was you know it was part of a route to, to, to become that and obviously a lot of people uh, as we said like Suella Braverman and perhaps um, less enthusiastic like Kwasi Kwarteng were were uh, chairman of the of the Bay group and it was very much seen as a route to that now a lot of the young people come through the majority of the young people come through don't want to be MPs they want to be commentators they want to be media figures because the power um, as is often said, those in Parliament that are in office, they're no longer in power. Mm. The power now exists outside of, of Parliament and parliamentarians are buffeted by opinions of the day. And where I think Rise of the Outsiders made a good point and something that, that I discussed with many of my peers coming up in 2010, there was a time where really, if you were Prime Minister of the country, or if you were the establishment, you only really had to worry about 10 media outlets. They're just, you know, there were some newspapers and there were a few TV channels and that was it. And so it was possible to basically buy everyone off. It was possible to, to work with everyone, bring them all inside the tent and make sure they weren't doing anything that um, the establishment didn't like. Now there is such a sheer plethora of, of media outlets that are geared obviously to tapping into a viewership that don't agree with the establishment view that um, I think that, that it is now impossible to control. It is impossible to silence uh, those, those views. And I think that will ultimately have a revolutionary effect on politics in the same way that uh, you know, Fox News uh, had in the United States. Unfortunately, um, in a financial sense, I'm not Roger Ailes, but perhaps fortunately in, in another sense but you know despite my um my lack of financial or business acumen in that field i'm very very glad that it's happened and i think it's a very good thing for the country that the people now have more options and more of a voice mm -hmm. and before we wrap up i just wanted to say on um gb news itself i really like the fact that they have mark stein who actually seems to be a big win for them in terms of getting someone that um adapt on there given how much of clout he has but that's just my opinion he offers some of the best monologues of the show in case anyone wants to look them up but uh we're finishing up now and i just wanted to say thank you for coming on if people wanted to find out more about you and the bow group in particular where can they find you what's your social media details and all of that so the bow group's on twitter at bow group um we're also at bowgroup.org online but i don't think anyone really does that anymore it's mainly social media now and i'm at um b underscore hq mm -hmm. and I'm told that um, due to the due to Twitter being under new ownership, I might be unshadow banned soon. So who knows what will happen after that? Mm. Sky's the limit. <laughs> I've been unshadow banned, so I think there's good signs yet. But thank you for coming on. And usually I don't have recurring guests, but you're too damn interesting to leave it one episode, if I'm being honest. And maybe I could have you on again in the future. Thank oh, you for coming on, and have a good evening. You too. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks for watching. If you like that and want to see more, please like and subscribe, as well as share. 
For longer episodes of the show with exclusive content, check out the audio versions of these podcasts, which are linked in the description below. If you would like to recommend guests, as well as get some other exclusive perks related to the show, please consider subscribing to both my Patreon and or subscribe to Scar account, as linked in the description below as well. And I hope to see you next time. Have a good day.